Okay, so um, we are in Ephesians 5 and um, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself also a lot of, you know, um, wisdom and uh, perspective to how to, uh, how, you know, the, the role of the husband and the wife and the, you know, the, the uh, outlook of the husband and the wife towards their own spouses. So very, very um, uh, wise counsel and, uh, you know, the revelation, uh, which is, which is really, you know, what, uh, uh, what we actually share with every uh, couple you know, planning to get married, and and this is like a, this is like a formula for success of their marriage, right? So if they would follow this diligently and uh, knowing that the Spirit of God is empowering them to do it, right? Put to death the things of the flesh. So, so the flesh was, of course, always uh, you know try to rebel against this you know the world's culture and world's values will be you know making fun of these things you know like okay husband has to boss husband has to you know in certain cultures right husband has to um, you know sit around and boss and and be served to uh, and, and so on right but then we see something very very different um very radical um uh, in the way God sees marriage and God wants to see, um, you know, these kind of, um, uh, this uh, outlook in the husband and in the wife. It's something God wants. And right? so he's saying, husbands, love your church, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Um, and, you know, he gave himself undeservedly. He came in himself, um, you know, unconditionally and um, and sacrificially and so on. So that is how the husband is supposed to be. And, and uh, then, and this is how the wife is supposed to be, you know, the wife submitting to the. So when the husband uh, is leading with this kind of a uh, leadership, right? It's always for the betterment of the wife. It's always to serve and it's to love and to edify and to, you know. Um, so because if you if you look at the next verse, twenty six, that he might sanctify and cleanse and so. What is his, what is what is the Lord doing? He's, the Lord is actually beautifying the church, right? Is 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 presenting to himself a better version uh, or the best version of possible of the body, right? Of uh, of the church. So the husband also, in loving, in sacrificial loving, is also, you know, these things are happening, right? He's actually uh, setting apart, you know, consecrate. Uh, for uh, the the wife and with all this attention and and love and and so on so um so it's something which which causes marriage to thrive this is a design and this is how god intended it okay now uh well people have actually taken the first part of the instruction and abused abused it right uh say okay wife submit abused it and made you know uh, made fun of it there's been so much of damage to the body of christ because of it to the believers because of that right so uh, and you i mean you can take any part of scripture and then you can you know twist it around and use it for your own selfish um you know needs and then you know that doesn't glorify god we know for sure right it doesn't glorify god right so uh, so this is what uh, uh this is the instruction that we have if you look at verse 28 said says uh, I'm sorry 27 if you see that he might present to himself a glorious church so the way in which Christ ministers to the church the way in which Christ loves the church he, it's actually beautifying the church changing the church uh, you know and so the church is brought to a uh, a better uh, transformation happens, and the best version of the you know, of the church happens. Um, you know, the church doesn't remain the same; changes for the better. You know, the way in which Christ loves the church. So that's the expectation. You know, the way in which the husband loves and serves and uh, and honors um, uh, in in their relationship that changes the wife for the better. Um, there's transformation that's happening. Okay. 
Okay, so verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So here's another here's another aspect to loving the wife, saying as their own body. So no one hated his, his body. So uh, as you love yourself, you love your wife. In fact, you know, they're going to be, it, it is actually they are one flesh. In the marriage covenant, they are one flesh. Right? So, so, the, so here's the thing, you know, you, this is how you love. Um, as you love your own self. Now, the problem is, now, if I, you know, I am, if I, if I have a problem accepting myself, and if I have a problem loving myself, if I have a problem, um, you know, with that, you know, if there are deep, Im deep seated emotional uh, wounds or emo emotional pain where I'm not counting myself worthy uh, of being loved by the Lord, you know, I, or if I'm constantly putting myself down, there is low self-esteem, uh, you know, my, in terms of identity, if I'm still going to be seeking something, approval of man, and not comfortable with my own self, then it's going to be difficult for me to love uh, the wife as my myself, because I'm not accepting myself, I'm not loving myself. Right? So that's the other thing. So the thing is, the, so the, the best thing to do is to you know receive healing from all those maybe emotional hurts of the past emotional wounds of the past receive healing be made whole so that the the, the relationship can also thrive right um, look to god for approval not for man right and uh, uh, be secure in who you have been made and who you belong to that is, we belong to Christ, and we've been made a new creation in Christ. So, being secure in all that is very, very important, right? Uh, so that your relationship with your spouse uh, it also thrives. So, you see, you know, if if this doesn't happen, the vertical relationship with the Lord and what He has to made us, what He has changed us, if that is not strong. If that is, uh, you know, going to be shaky, then it's going to affect your relationship with your wife as well. Okay, so so that's the important thing, and therefore, you know, so Paul, you know, I, when we studied First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, we saw that Paul is saying, you know, do not be unequally yoked. Now, this is another aspect of it. Now, this is the reason: don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So, how can you? Be unequally yoked. Uh, I mean, how, how can you go on if you're unequally yoked? Because that person is going to not going to receive that love and uh, that healing and self worth and identity, you know, from Christ. And so, how are they going to be in a strong place of uh, of even sharing, right? Sharing that love and uh, and how are they going to do that? Okay, so verse 28, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Right? No one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So this is, um, this is. Uh, let me just share the notes. Uh, so this is something that uh, um, that is expected of the husband to nourish and cherish. Now, to nourish means to, to actually um, you know, bring in nutrition. Right to to make sure that there is uh, you know to to feed to make sure that there is you know proper nutrition you know and, and here nourishment is talking about emotional nourishment as well you know emotionally um, you know physically you nourish and to cherish cherish means to look at something as precious like to care for something as precious right. Um, to to hold something dear and precious to oneself, right? Suppose you have a, I don't know, maybe some somebody gave you a you know a present and something that is of great worth and value. Uh, it's something that is precious, right? You are careful with it, right? You are you, you don't treat it care carelessly, you know. Like uh, actually, uh, someone gifted me this guitar, right? Uh, it's a tailor. 
and a friend uh, actually uh, gifted me the guitar when um has completely took me by surprise and you know that you know this taylor guitar is it's quite an expensive guitar it, it's quite an expensive one uh, it's a great it's a good guitar so i i when i play with it then i wipe it clean and i put it back in the case uh, i make sure that i'm careful with it you know i don't treat it carelessly right um so it's something that i cherish it's of great value it's it's a great guitar uh, and uh, i make sure that it's it's protected and uh, i make sure that i value it i like it and i you know i make sure that it's no harm comes to it in the sense you know it's not damaged in any way i make sure i maintain it well so the whole thing of cherishing has that idea so saying husbands ought to nourish and cherish their own wives you know verse 29 for no one hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the lord does the church so this is what the lord does to us okay that's the reality that's the truth of it this is what the lord jesus does to us the church the believer he nourishes and he cherishes you know that that itself should bring a lot of healing emotionally you know that you are nourished by him by jesus that you are cherished by jesus you are counted as someone who's precious and uh, who's uh, he's he's looking at you as someone special he's looking at you as someone who's uh, uh, you know who who's uh, precious and uh, he's he's cherishing you know someone who's holding someone who's dear to him okay so uh, so this is what christ does so this is what is expected of the husband as well so you see so when a husband loves sacrificially just like christ loved the church when as a husband nourishes the wife when a husband um, you know cherishes the wife then it's no problem it's no problem for the wife to submit to yield to such a kind of leadership right so so this is this is um, god's recipe or ingredient for for marriage right the design for marriage so to so this is something that paul shares with the you know with the, with the efficient church uh, to the believers so this is what you know you need to this is how you need to be in marriage right um so which is again uh, uh, you know quite a paradigm shift because the jews actually considered women to be of a lower uh you know lower uh strata right they were as women to be unequal to man uh and and so on so that was the general jewish um you know uh, mindset but here is all you know it was totally you know being changed by god uh, you know by the lord as he had his encounter with god and, and you know completely um you know bringing in the revelation first of all salvation by faith uh, to the salvation which is by the grace of god and through faith and that itself was another radical thing for a jewish mind because it was all about laws and keeping laws and doing all those things and uh, rituals and so on uh, and so that is self and here we see you know bringing in hey, this is the picture of the husband and the wife right so uh, so we see Paul sharing that relation with the church okay um let's let's uh, look at the further um so he says we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother is quoting from genesis and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh okay so 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 this is uh, another aspect of marriage that the, the two becomes one okay and uh, and and the thing is that he's saying this is a mystery you know how is it the two different people you know when they come into the covenant of marriage they they actually you know this is this this is what happens they become one so which means that if i'm doing anything harmful for my spouse uh, i'm actually hurting myself if i'm hurting my spouse if i'm spitefully saying something doing something you know i am actually hurting the relationship of course but above all i'm hurting myself because i am 
one flesh with her right so so this is and, and then paul says in verse 32 this is a great mystery but i speak concerning christ and the church now so the lord considers the church the believers to be part of his body you know that is why you know we read when we when we read uh, uh, paul's encounter right uh, with um, uh, on the road to damascus uh, it's very interesting right so he says uh, acts chapter 9 and verse 4 okay if you can read now here is saul he has fallen off the the uh, horse or donkey or whatever he has fallen off he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him saul saul why are you persecuting me okay the lord is saying so who was paul saul persecuting he was per persecuting those people who were following christ right all those people who were following christ he was persecuting now here is what jesus uh, asks saul why are you persecuting he didn't the lord didn't ask why are you persecuting the people who are following me he said why are you persecuting me okay and that is what we see here right this is a great mystery i speak concerning christ and the church chapter 5 verse 30 is saying hey they are one body we are one in the spirit right those who are in christ are one spirit with him so this is what it is this is the reality and this is um this is a mystery how does it happen when a person believes in christ puts his her his or her faith in christ becomes one body uh one spiritual body part of the spiritual body of christ right is placed in the spiritual body of christ is is one spirit within the spirit of um the holy spirit comes and indwells this is the reality and this is why the lord jesus asked saul you know why are you persecuting me okay my body these are people who are part of my body i'm connected with them you are persecuting me i'm the head of the body and these are members of the body right okay nevertheless um, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and they let the wife see that she respects her husband okay so uh, he finishes all those instructions uh, in 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 there okay uh, so that is about the husband and the wife right so we move on to chapter 6 right next um okay so we move, move on to chapter 6 um, let's read the first few verses children obey your parents in the lord for this is right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the lord okay so children obey and honor your parents in the lord okay and uh, you know as we as children as we grow up and as we have earthly parents we are still children right uh, for our parents and we are still expected to honor uh, our parents in the lord okay so we continue to honor our parents um, even though they might be elderly even though they might be quite senior as long as they are here they are alive on the earth we are we are to as children we are to honor them okay so as we uh, 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 as we honor them you know of course we we are we become independent like financially we, we are not dependent on them anymore maybe uh, as we you know maybe get a get work and we we earn for ourselves and maybe we we move and we live separately so we're not dependent on them in that in that manner um, and they are maybe at one stage they become dependent on us you know we support them and we we we, get, we continue to honor them and so on so uh, we may not you know 
obey them implicitly in the sense um, you know as children as as when we are children and we are when we are under the you know under their uh, protection under their care and when they are providing for our needs yes um, you know we we are we have to obey right um, and there are but as we grow we we make our own choices and it says obey your parents in the lord you know, that's true if if parents are you know uh, uh especially you know parents are asking you to do something which is contrary to the word of god you know which is uh, which is totally opposite right the instructions or something that they are asking us to obey is contrary to the word of god contrary to uh, you know god's ways then we we have right not to obey okay because it says very clearly obey your parents in the lord honor your father and your mother yeah, and yes there are certain times that you know as long as it's not sinful as long as as it not uh, is not something that is against the word of god right um so what is the thing yeah, what is the outcome of that it says um, that honor them uh, you know when we go to um um sorry uh, yeah 6 and verse 2 right yeah So Deuteronomy talks about how uh, it is uh, Deuteronomy five and verse sixteen. Let's uh, just just go there. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter five and verse um, verse sixteen. When the Lord gives the commands uh, commandment, um, it says, "Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord." your god has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the lord your god is giving you so so here's a promise that comes with uh with this instruction or with this command to obey your parents right um so it comes with a promise that it might be that it may be well with you so the lord wants to you know fulfill this part of the promise that may be well with you that you may live long on the earth okay and here's a instruction for fathers especially it says fathers do not provoke your children right what does what does that mean provoke your children to wrath which means that to provoke is to do something in order to get a reaction right to do something maybe to tease maybe to um, you know do something so that you know you provoke a reaction from them so here the reaction is wrath no don't provoke them to anger don't do something just to you know maybe tease them or you know say something do something to, so that they become angry and bitter right so uh, do not provoke them to wrath uh, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the lord so we see the husbands being you know uh, being priests in the house right uh, i mean well both the husband and the wife are you know we are a royal priesthood as redeemed uh, as redeemed people we are kings and priests unto the lord so we take that rightful position as priests in the house as well right that responsibility we don't as men as husbands we don't you know put it off on someone else right we take that um place they take up that responsibility to train uh to bring them up in the training and admonition of the lord okay to <coughs> sorry um so which means that uh, admonition meaning uh, a warning or a rebuke um so what the lord wants what the lord does not want right so to direct them to nurture them nurture the children so well sometimes you know husband say okay i don't want that responsibility you know let someone else take care i'll provide for their needs i'll help discipline them and and but you know this thing of in the lord uh bringing them in the ways of the lord i just want to give it to someone else maybe my wife will do that or maybe the grandparents will do that or maybe the you know the children's uh, pastor will do that no it is the responsibility of 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 the parents and specifically here we see that it's a responsibility of the husband to do that 
right? So bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Here next, we see uh, something to do with uh, an employer-employee uh, relationship, right? In that kind of a, maybe a work setting. Here it's talking about bond servants. Of course, uh, it's talking about a, 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 a time when uh, they were culturally you know they they had slaves and they uh, so that is what it means the the, the bond servant the word used there doulos means uh, uh, a slave right someone who, who was subservient someone who was uh, living in subjection to the master and so on so here is saying you know bond servants be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Okay, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, which means that you know, in that work. Uh, so today we can actually apply it in our workplace relationships with our boss, okay, with whoever's whoever whoever's overseeing, you know, our work. Uh, maybe if it's ministry, it's you know who was overseeing our work and uh, our, our ministry. So who was there in that place? So saying, be obedient uh, it, according to the in sincerity of heart as unto Christ. So let it be sincere. It's uh, and then he goes on to say in verse six, not with eye service as with. Um, yeah, not with eye service as men please us, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Okay, so so this is, this is what he means when he says, okay, uh, be bonds, uh, be, um, you know, serve uh, uh, and be obedient in sincerity of heart. So this, is, this is what is what he means by sincerity of heart, which is not with eye service, which means that you know, when people watch or people are ob observing me, then I behave in a different way, right? I'm uh, I, I'm doing things in a different way. But when people are, when I'm not being watched, then I behave a certain way. You know, if if my work, the quality of work, or my hours of work. Um, the kind of effort that I put into work, if it's going to be different when people are watching than when people are not watching, you know, in the in a sense, when people are watching, maybe I'm putting in more effort, when people are watching, I'm being more careful, more diligent because somebody's watching. Um, and then if they are not watching, then if I'm going to be slacking off, you know, I'm not going, I'm not putting in as much effort. I'm not put, putting in uh, as much quality or excellence in it, then I'm actually doing eye service men pleasers. I, I'm, I'm, that is how, uh, that is my output. I'm, I'm just being a man, man pe people pleaser. I'm being a people pleaser. Because they are watching, I do this. right? So, so it's not as men pleasers, not with I service, but uh, as born servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So, so to the born servants, he's saying you are actually born servants of Christ. So you do the will of God from your heart. Um, so God's will is for you to give your best, whether people are watching or not because he is watching. So do the will of God from your heart. Okay, verse 7, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Okay. So it's a it's a win-win situation, both for the employer and the employee. So to the employee, you know, the one who is actually being employed in, in a particular place, uh, serving in a particular place, he says that this is how you serve, you, you do it as unto the Lord, not to man, because that's the truth, right? But you, whatever you're doing, so which means that 
you know you look at it you know the work that you do uh, you know there's uh, there's nothing secular you know, though we might use that term to describe you know a person who is maybe not in so called full time ministry but then in the eyes of the lord the work that we do you know it could be whatever sweeping swabbing it could, whatever work it is right maybe we are employed somewhere uh, maybe you know we might we might look at it as something very very unspiritual you're saying oh, what is you know what's what's the thing about this maybe the, you know if i'm going to be preaching and teaching and praying then then the lord that gives me favor then the lord would you know be pleased well that that is not so I mean, that's not so we, we know right right from the old testament daniel was you know in in administration of of the nation right? uh, we saw joseph uh, being a minister a prime minister of that nation right so they were indulging or doing work they were engaged in doing work which today we would say hey, that is so unspiritual you might say that is unspiritual you know they are uh, what is spiritual about it but then here we see you know you're doing it as unto the lord with good will doing service as unto the lord knowing that whatever good anyone does he will receive from the lord now the lord is watching and the lord is saying okay I, I, he will receive you know I, i'm going to bless this person because of the kind of work that they're doing because they are doing it as unto me right not to please people okay so it's it's so any work that we're doing when we do it as unto the lord it is the lord who blesses it is the lord you know anyone who he will receive from the lord whether he is a slave or free you know that's a very encouraging thing that um, well whatever kind of work that i'm doing i could be working in the field i could be doing some agriculture i could be a you know taxi driver i could be a cook i could be a you know working professional in an it company i could be a doctor whatever teacher um i could be taking you know uh, care care of someone in an orphanage or you know old age home whatever work i'm doing i'm actually supposed to do as unto the lord because he is my boss you know over and above than earthly boss or earthly employer he is the one uh, so i'm supposed to do it as unto him as you know we knowing that he's watching me all the time right so when i do that you know i receive from him so this will change the way we look at work it will change the way we work right? the change the way the kind of effort that we put in into work right so and the best part is this verse 9 you masters you do the same things to them okay so you also do the same things in the sense you, you let your outlook change masters you give up threatening okay or don't you treat them well is in other words this is what he's saying you treat them well you treat them as a, a fellow human being right uh, giving up threatening knowing that your own master also is in heaven okay now you might be an earthly boss but know that you have a heavenly boss yourself who's watching over you okay so you know that he is your boss so you better be a good boss to the employee the way he is good to you you be good to them right the way he has been gracious to you you be gracious the way he has been forgiving you be forgiving the way he has been compassionate you be compassionate right um well it's also same also true in the sense uh, you know when you look at john chapter 15 the lord is looking for fruit right so it's it's not a bad thing to expect the employee to to do well to hold the employee accountable to the tasks okay uh, maybe it's the timeliness of it i want i need to finish it at a certain time i want this kind of work to be done it is it is not wrong okay like john chapter 15 and uh, and uh, right verse verse 2 every branch in me that does bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit right 
um, and then uh, I am the true vine, and Father is the vine dresser, of course, verse one. And then he says um, in uh, um, in, in uh, verse four, you know, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Um, vine neither can you, right? Uh, and uh, which means that the father is actually looking for fruit. Right? The father is looking for fruit. He's looking for productivity. And that is his expectation. Right? That is his desire. That is his expectation. So, and and he's observing, okay, this is fruitful. So I'm going to prune that it can be even more fruitful. Okay, so that's his expectation. So as my heavenly father is expecting that, you know, of me, so I can have that expectation for, uh, I mean, for whoever I am overseeing. Okay, it's, it's nothing wrong, but I do that in an honorable manner. I do that in a, you know, in a loving manner. I do that. I could do that in a, in a, in a manner that's firm, but I need to speak the truth in love, right? So, so these are things that we understand. Okay. Uh, there's so much that we learn about work, about work relationships here. Okay, so now from verse 10 onwards, uh, he's just making a shift now uh, from the um, natural relationships and you know uh, natural things. He's, he's shifting to something you know uh, uh, that is happening in the spiritual realm, okay, in the spirit world, spiritual realm. So let's look at that. You know, he says, "Finally, my brethren," verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that i may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which i am an ambassador in chains that in it i may speak boldly as i ought to speak Okay, so a lot of instructions here in this passage, right? And and a, and a revelation about the spiritual reality. Okay, a revelation about what is happening in the in the spirit world. Okay, so let's look at verse ten. It says, "Finally, my brethren, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might." Okay, the Good News Bible says, "Is finally build up your strength." in union with the Lord and by means of his mighty power. Build up your strength. Be strong. Okay, so uh, so what he's saying is build up your strength in union with the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. So what is the, you know, the strength of the Lord is, uh, is, is supernatural, right? The power of the Lord, the strength of the Lord is, is something that is supernatural. That is not uh, natural ability. So saying in the lord you are in the lord be strong okay be strong in the lord and uh, says and in the power of his might okay so the word used there be strong is uh, uh, is something that is derived from dunamis en dunamo you know which means uh, you know dunamis we know is a is the power of god you know which makes things happen it's like the creative power of god um so saying you be clothed in that you be strong in that you be empowered by that right uh, 
be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that when the word power is talking about strength, dominion, etc. Right? Be strong in the Lord, meaning empowered by the dunamis power of God and uh, uh, and in the power of uh, sorry be strong in the lord refers to that and then uh, and also in the power of his might refers to you know the word strength uh, the word uh, it, it can even be vigor and uh, so on it means force right uh, kratos uh, that's the word which is used there and kratos of his might okay so that word is again a different word. So he's using three words here, strong, be strong. He's using a word called endunamo, means be empowered by the uh, by the power of the Lord, the dunamis of the Lord. And then he's using another word, and in the power of his might, so the, the word used there, that power is kratos, which means strength or force. And uh, again, he uses another word, which is might. Uh, which is ixus, which means, uh, sorry, iskus, which means uh, force or strength or you know, a ability and so on. So the ability of the Lord. So what is he saying? You know, you're, you have your natural ability. Okay. You have your natural strength. Fine. But be strong in something else. So what is he saying? Be strong in the supernatural ability of God, which is, you know, which is the privilege of every believer, you and I, to come to the place of being built up in the supernatural ability of the Lord. Such a privilege. God is all powerful. God is, uh, you know, all mighty and it's for us to because we are called to be partakers you know of the divine nature we are called to be you know we have we, have, we are indeed one spirit with him the the supernatural god the holy spirit indwells us so it's it's for us we can be strong in the lord and in the power of his mind so paul is just exhorting you know you have so you have natural strength you have natural abilities you have natural way of doing things according to your physical body but now i want you to you know shift to another realm it's the supernatural power of god it's the endunum or dunamis of god it's the iskus of god it's the kratos of god you know now you be strong in that you have to increase in power in that right um in your union with lord Okay, so um, yeah, so is, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Okay, now why is he, why is he saying, you know, why why is he asking the believer to do that? You know, he's going to ask the believer to uh, do something else. He says in verse eleven, put on the whole, whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes, against the wiles of the devil. Okay, against the schemes of the enemy, against the uh, deceptive strategies of the devil. Now, for that, you need to be strong in this. You need to be strong with spiritual, uh, you know, spiritually, you need to be strong. You need to be strong with the supernatural strength of God. The supernatural spiritual ability uh, has to come from, from him. Right? You be strong in that. And put on the whole armor of god okay, god has given you an armor uh which is uh, you know all and, and he uses the imagery of the roman soldier a roman soldier he's, he's talking about uh, you know uh, the the pieces of armor his individual piece he's using that kind of a picture you know the, what a roman soldier would wear uh as part of the armor so he's using that picture and um, and, and he's and he's talking about this, right? So he's saying, okay, um, so you put on the whole armor of God. Okay, so uh, uh, a Roman soldier would uh, would carry a belt, uh, and the, the belt would be about six inches wide, and it would 
it would help to uh, keep every part of the armor in place, tight in place, right? Um, so that you you are comfortable and nothing is shaking and nothing is dragging. You know, you just it's all tight and snug and tight, and and you're you you know you're confident. Okay, uh, every part the you know the breastplate was held in place the the uh, shore, the sorry the shield was also you know uh, uh, it was also uh, hung on from one side of the belt uh, when it was not used and so it's like uh, the belt was a very important part which which really uh, a part of the armor which actually held every piece of the clothing and the armor together Right. The sword was also there uh, when, when it was in the sheath when it was not used. So, so we see all this, right? It, uh, it's a kind of a uh, something that uh, holds everything together. Secondly, it talks about the breastplate. Um, so this for the Roman soldier, it was two large metal uh, plates uh, which cover the front and the back. Or something that is worn in front and one worn in the back, so uh, it protected the you know the shoulder. And uh, apparently, this was the heaviest part of the armor. Uh, and different designs, and um, it, it, it and from the neck to the waist. Okay, and it also below the waist, it also extended as some kind of a skirt kind of a design. So. You see that it's it was heavy, it was uh, protective, and it was there uh, both in front and back. Uh, and the shoes, the Roman soldier, uh, the shoes had two pieces of metal, one that went from the knee that covered the you know front and the side of the calf, and went all the way to the foot. Okay, so wow, it's like. Uh, I wonder how they walked in all this, you know, uh, carrying all this weight. So, but that was that was it. At the bottom, uh, at the sole, were spikes, nails, which are three, one to three inches long, and uh, also these were these were also used, you know, as weapons, right? Inflict wounds on weapons and so on. So, uh, there's a that is a shoe. Then we have a shield. You now there were two kinds of shields. There was a small round shield, uh, which was a which was a shield used for ceremonial for, for ceremonies the other one which was uh, which was almost uh, a, as tall as the person right and uh, the, and so it was uh, made of several layers of leather about six layers of leather tightly woven together uh, it was large it was wide it can protect the entire body you know, it was so tall and uh, protect the entire body and it was soaked in water when, when and in the battle, if there were arrows which were set on fire and which were fired on, you know, which were shot at the, um, so the this shield would actually put out that fiery arrows which were shot by the enemy. Okay, so that's a shield. Then the helmet, helmet covered the head, the face, and protected the soldier. Then they, of course, we carried the sword. Which was, uh, you know, which was sharp. Which was two edges. Both the edges were sharp. You know, like that is, uh, if you, this is a sword. This and this both are sharp. You know, our kitchen knives. You know, one end is not sharp. This there is a sharp end, right? Which we cut. The other end is not. Then this is a double-edged sword, which means that both the both the edges are sharp. Okay, so, uh, so it's a double-edged sword, and. Uh, Pointed and designed for inflicting damage on the enemy. Then he also had carried a lance or a long spear, okay, which he could throw at the enemy, like a javelin, throw at the enemy, and it would, uh, you know, it would uh, kill or, uh, you know, wound the enemy from a distance. So, so the thing is that uh, Paul writes and he says, "Put on the whole armor of God." Okay, put on this whole armor of God that you may be able to, verse 11, stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So put on the whole armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
okay we'll stop here and the next class we'll we'll finish this and also we will start with philippians okay philippians there are four chapters uh, colossians there are four chapters we will go through them uh, quickly and and then we will start with thessalonians 1 and 2 right okay um so we so far we haven't actually put out i haven't put out the question papers yet uh, so both galatians and ephesians i'll put it as you know separate papers uh tests for the tests uh, for the and then i will let you know okay um yeah okay thank you we'll stop here thank you, see you right bye bye